Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Marcus Plesha. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Association of State and Territory Health Officials. And I'm glad to be here with you today doing a interview as part of our ongoing technical assistance to states around COVID-19. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on having a discussion around some of the modeling strategies that are being used for, for um, our interventions around COVID-19. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Nirav Shah here with us uh, to speak about modeling, which he has a great deal of experience in. Uh, Dr. Shaw is a senior scholar at Stanford University, and he's the former commissioner of the New York State Department of Health. He's a leader in patient safety and quality, innovation and digital health, and the strategies required to transition to lower cost patient-centered healthcare. And Dr. Shaw has been doing quite a bit of modeling lately and has a good perspective on it and a, a great ability to sort of explain some of the basic concepts. So we're gonna just jump right in and, and ask him a couple of questions and and hopefully uh, help all of you have a better grasp of what modeling is and what some of the best models might be for us to use in public health. Thank you for having me. And you know, we've been using models for different purposes over time and models are just a reflection of reality. They're a mirror that we hold up to understand what's going on in ways that our brain can't perhaps process things. So for example, with an exponential disease uh, like COVID, uh, it's very hard for us to understand what two cases one day looks like four cases, eight cases, 16 cases in uh, as uh, few as three or four doubling periods of three days each. So for us to really get a handle on planning, understand capacity relative to our historic plans, which may not have had such assumptions, models quickly get us to a good enough answer that's right in direction and order of magnitude that perhaps we don't have on our own. Great, and now should, should state health officials or policy makers, makers in general, should they be using a range of models or should they really choose a single model and stick to that? Well, models, I, I like to say that all models are flawed, right? They are not a perfect reflection of reality. And so depending on your needs, uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, definitely choose different models. It's sometimes hard to pick models and evaluate which one's better or, or, or worse for a given uh, purpose. For example, many folks have been using the IHME model out of University of Washington to project, uh, understand and project capacity needs in health systems. That model is uh, focused on death. It, it uses only a lagging indicator to create the whole model, which may be perfect for your needs, but you should understand what its inputs are so that you can understand the limitations of its output. Other models, like the model from covidactnow.org, uses a combination of deaths and hospitalizations for COVID to come up with um, more nuanced approaches, especially in the short term, of what a given county's needs are. And I think you may have answered this question partly just now, but you know, our, talk to us a little bit about some of the emerging tools that you think the state and territory health officials should be aware of if they want to be proactive, target resources well, and, and really be aware of trends. I know you've spoken a little bit to that, but are there, are there other things you want to point out? Certainly. So the, the model I mentioned, covidactnow.org, is one that's been created recently, only in the last month, by a bunch of technologists in Silicon Valley, experts out of Georgetown, Harvard, and elsewhere. And I think that's one of the better models out there. The military uses it today. I understand that India used that model to lock down 1.2 billion people. And uh, where it is useful is because of its transparency as well. Uh, unlike other models, this is fully uh, available on the internet. You can understand all of the assumptions. Uh, you can even make a copy of the model for yourself and change the assumptions if you sh would like to. And so we'll, we'll get to that a little later in terms of evaluating a model, but that's one model that I think, uh, and, and uh, full disclosure, I'm an unpaid advisor to that uh, group as well. Uh, but that's one of the better models out there uh, among the plethora of models available. Depending on your needs, as I said, there are going to be different models for hospital capacity, for public health response, for social distancing, for understanding COVID in the community. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us or, or uh, bring to the attention of state health officials about that particular model? Well, I think it, this applies to all of our models. Today, our data, our best data is not that good. 
the amount of all of these models are basing their data on a combination of either death, which is a lagging indicator, as I suggested, and is incomplete a picture because we're learning from our European uh, friends that there are many deaths not attributed to COVID that are not attributed to COVID because either the person wasn't tested or the person died at home or in another setting. And so there's an underestimate of COVID-related deaths, not only in all of Europe, but probably in parts of America where we're not testing yet. Second, the hospital data is a very good source of data in that if you have how, much, how many people are admitted for COVID to a hospital, about half our states are reporting that. It's not clear for the other half whether they're just providing cumulative numbers, partial numbers, or not at all. This is a very important data point. And if you're in one of those states that is not reporting transparently both daily and cumulative counts of hospital admissions, uh, please work on changing that right away. Because that data, the exponential curve of hospitalizations is one of the best signals to understand not only subsequent deaths or mortality or other health systems needs, but also how much COVID is in the community. Once these graphs, once these data points reach exponential, whether it's hospitalization, whether it's death, whether it's confirmed COVID cases based on testing in the community, all of them start to act very much like one another. Today, we urgently need state level daily counts of hospitalizations for COVID. Great, so if, if one's a policymaker or a state health official, trying to decide, you know, trying to select a model that they might want to use to best um, understand how the epidemic is going to affect their community. You know, what are some ideas about how they would choose a model that's reputable? Are there, are there any principles that you might suggest for vetting a good model? I think it's actually not as hard as it might seem. First of all, does the model reflect reality at a high level? You know, are the numbers uh, on the order of magnitude correct? Are they moving in the right direction? Are they matching what other countries ahead of us in the pandemic have seen or other counties if you're in a state? Second, is the model robust? Does it rely on risky assumptions? What decisions does that model lead us to? And what would happen to our decision if this model were off by 10%, 50%, 90%, right? Those are questions we should ask. Is the model transparent? Can you review it? Is it how it works easily understood or explained? And can you connect with the team who made the model to get down into the assumptions level? Is the model clear about what its limitations are and its unknowns are? Do they openly admit what they don't know and articulate what the model is good or not well, uh, well suited for? Almost every model, the further you go out, you go out five, six, seven plus weeks, it's not gonna be good. But in the near term, they're all going to be good. How do they talk about that? How do they talk about the inflection point? Are they open about the fact that the model will change? You know, we've seen many models in recent days revise their estimates down. I think that's a good thing. We want all our models to be wrong if we actually tamp down the disease enough and hopefully we get ahead of it. So, so that, those are some of the things. And finally, I, I also add, has the model been vetted? Has it been tried, peer reviewed uh, by outside experts and endorsed? I think those are the principles. Does it reflect reality at a high level? Is it robust? Is it transparent? Is it clear about unknowns and limitations? And is it vetted? Well, great. Thank you for talking to us a little bit about modeling. Um, they're clearly not as intimidating as they might seem at first blush, and you've done a great job of explaining some of the different factors to think about and, and also talking about some of the experience you've had. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule.